For the call to worship, we'll be reading from Psalm 63. Psalm 63. A Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory, so I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness, that is Christ Jesus in his mercy and grace toward me, the, the sinner, is better than life, better than life itself. My lips shall praise thee. Thus I will bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with morrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Let's pray. <clears throat> oh God, our Father in heaven, how we bless you in the sanctuary for your darling son, your only begotten son, for making him your loving kindness toward us or being saved by his blood. How we pray that we might see something of his power and his glory in delivering us from all our enemies. How we pray for your Holy Spirit to do what we cannot here and in every place where your gospel is preached. We pray in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Number 296 from your hardback hymnal. 296. <laughs> Savior leads me, what have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy, who through life has been my guide? Heavenly peace, divinest comfort, here by faith in him to dwell. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. For I know whate'er befall me, Jesus doeth all things well. All the way my Savior leads me, cheers each winding path I tread, gives me grace for every trial, feeds me with the living bread. Though my weary steps may falter and my soul a thirst may be, gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. Gushing from the rock before me, lo, a spring of joy I see. All the way my Savior leads me, oh, the fullness of his love. Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed immortal wings its flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages Jesus led me all the way. This my song through endless ages. Jesus led me all the way. Please be seated. Adam's going to bring special music.
dark the stain that soiled man's nature long the distance that he fell far removed from hope and heaven into deep despair and hell but there was a fountain open and the blood of God's own Son purifies the soul and reaches deeper than the stain has gone. Praise the Lord for full salvation. God still reigns upon his throne. And I know the blood still reaches deeper than the stain has gone. Conscious of the deep pollution, sinners wander in the night. Though they hear the shepherd calling, they still fear to face the light. This the blessed consolation that can melt the heart of stone. That sweet balm of Gilead reaches Deeper than the stain has gone Praise the Lord for full salvation God still reigns upon his throne And I know the blood still reaches Deeper than the stain has gone. All unworthy we who've wandered, and our eyes are wet with tears as we think of love that sought us through the weary, wasted years. Yet we walk. The holy highway Walking by God's grace alone Knowing Calvary's fountain reaches Deeper than the stain has gone Praise the Lord for full salvation God still reigns upon his throne and I know the blood still reaches Deeper than the stain has gone When with holy choirs we're standing In the presence of the King And our souls are lost in wonder While the white robe choir sing then we'll praise the name of Jesus with the millions round the throne praise him for the power that reaches deeper than the stain has gone praise the Lord for full salvation God still reigns upon his throne And I know the blood still reaches Deeper than the stain has gone Thank you, Adam. I'm so thankful for that. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel 17. There are so many glorious truths to this story that we find in our Bibles 
of David and Goliath, truths that directly speak to my heart, and I hope they will to you, truths that apply to where I live. Um, this story is not an allegory, it's not a parable. It's an actual historical event where David, representing all of Israel, goes up against the giant of the Philistines and slays him. And yet, if we fail to see the spiritual meaning of it for our lives, then it will be nothing to us than an Old Testament story. Um, Robert and I were talking about this uh, recently, and he said that he was reading a Puritan who wrote a book on this story. And he spent pages in his book talking about uh, the details of the, of the helmet that Goliath wore and how that stone would have gotten to his head uh, through that helmet. I thought, well, that sounds like a Puritan. Um, you know, just wasting your time uh, trying, to, trying to look at details that have no meaning to them. They have no significance. I want us to look at this story for the, the spiritual importance that it is for you and for me. I've titled this message, What Have You Proved? What Have You Proved? And um, before we introduce that, let's read the text. We'll begin in 1 Samuel um, chapter 17 and uh, begin reading in verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor. You know, Saul was the king. And for 40 days, we know at least, the Israelites were hunkered down behind the rocks, fearful of the Philistine. What do you suppose Saul's servants were doing? Polishing his armor? Sharpening his sword? <laughs> was there any more glorious armor than... Saul would have had any sharper sword than what Saul would have owned and Saul hears David say is there not a cause and he wants to go up against against this giant and so Saul says well I'm going to give him the best and so he puts on Saul's arm Saul put his armor on him <clears throat> And it was a helmet of brass upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. Now the importance of that is that when the Lord describes the armor of Goliath, he tells us that Goliath had a helmet of brass and a armor of mail. And so what's happening here is that Saul, a picture of the arm of flesh, thinks that we're going to fight fire with fire. We're going to defeat this enemy with the same armor that he's coming against us with. Now, oftentimes, you and I have done that. Try to defeat spiritual enemies with the arm of flesh. <clears throat> And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him, 
And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. The servants of Saul didn't, didn't make these stones smooth. These stones have been smoothed by none other than God himself as they rolled around in the brook. These were, these were God's uh, weapons. <clears throat> and he put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had had, even in a script, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine, and the Philistine came and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. Goliath didn't carry his own shield. I mentioned this a couple of Sundays ago. The shield is representative of faith, the shield of faith. Which, and, and perhaps if Goliath had had his own shield, maybe he could have raised it in time to deflect the stone that was coming. But he had an armor bearer carrying his own shield. <laughs> And here's the application of that. You can't trust someone else to have faith for you. You've got to have faith yourself. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog? Now contrast that to what that Syrophoenician woman said when the Lord told her that it wasn't right to take the children's bread and give it unto dogs. He, he, he called that woman, that Gentile woman, a dog, which is what the Jews would have referred to all Gentiles as dogs. And what did the Syrophoenician woman say when the Lord said that about her? Truth, Lord. <laughs> truth lord i'm a dog but the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table now this this philistine is offended that anyone would suggest that he was a dog what a what a glorious truth when the lord jesus himself calls us a dog we respond with truth, Lord. Truth, Lord, that's all I am. Oh, would you, just, would you just slide a few crumbs off your table for me? That's all I need. You know, the truth is that one crumb from God is better than all the fare that this world has to offer. <laughs> one crumb will feed your soul. And the Philistines said, verse 43, unto David, am I a dog that you come against me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistines said unto David, come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, thou comest to me with sword and with spear and with a shield. Saul wanted me to come against you with a sword and with a shield and with a spear. But I had not proved those things, and I had to take them off. Now I have nothing but a sling and five smooth stones given to me by God. And you come against me with the arm of flesh. I come against you. In the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. This is my cause. My cause is the glory of God. And this day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee, and take thy head from thee. And I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, and all the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. <clears throat> Goliath didn't have a chance. <laughs> the Lord was on David's side. And the enemies of God never have a chance against God. 
Nothing's changed. Same thing's true. Depends on what weapons we go against that enemy with. And that's why I ask the question, what have you proved? David said, I haven't proved these things. They don't work for me. I've got to go in what I know is true. What I know I have experienced by proving that the Lord God of Israel will deliver me. That he knew. Verse 47, and all the assembly shall know, all the assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. So here's this Philistine standing in all of his grandeur and all of his power and young David runs toward him. And David put his hand into his bag and he took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into the forehead and he fell upon the face of the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and smote the Philistine, and slew him. But there was no sword in David's hand. <clears throat> now, you and I have some spiritual enemies that we have to battle every day. Sin, and Satan, flesh, the world, the certainty of death, the grave, the judgment of God. And here we have a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ as our representative defeating the enemy of God at Calvary's cross as he ran toward Jerusalem. He set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. And what a glorious picture of victory this is that every child of God is able to rest in the hope of knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ himself got the victory by himself. And we rest all the hope of our salvation in him. And he did not do it in the arm of flesh. He did it in the power of God. <clears throat> the Lord tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. So here we are. Here we are engaged in this spiritual battle, the one that has already been won by Christ. And the Lord tells us that he has given to us weapons. He gave to David those five smooth stones and that all of the polished and sharpened weapons of the flesh are, are not sufficient Ephesians chapter 6 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our enemies aren't men. They're not governments. The Lord said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities and against powers and against rulers of darkness and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And then he says, therefore, put on the armor of God. You will put off what you have not proved and put on what you have proved. David said to Saul, these things don't work for me. I have found the power of God to be the only power that enables me to engage in this spiritual battle. And the And the polished and sharpened armor of the king are not sufficient for me to fight this battle. What have you proved? I know you're engaged in a warfare. I know you're in a battle. What have you proved? The Lord tells us in Colossians chapter 3, put off the old man and put on the new man. You see, we, we put on that armor which we have proved, and we take off that which we have not proved. In Zechariah chapter 3, the, prophets, uh, the Lord said to the prophet, I will clothe thee with a change of garment. The garments that you have by nature are not sufficient for this battle. I will give to you spiritual weapons to fight in this spiritual battle. You will put on what you've proved and take off that which you've not proved. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. You see, the truth is that Every time we find ourselves confronted with these giants, like David, our first reaction might be to put on the king's armor. And then when we get them on and we realize we can't function with this, we assay them, as the scripture says of David. We, we say no to them. No, we can't do that. <laughs> I've got to have a different, a different uh, weapon to fight this battle. I can't fight it in the arm of flesh. I've tried that. It doesn't work for me. I must put that off. And I must put on that which God has proven To prove something is to establish the truth of it. To prove something is to show the genuineness of it. To subject something to a test and to prove it as reliable. To confirm or validate the claims and the reliability of something. That is what it means to prove something. What have you proven? What have you proven? You have your Bibles open to Ephesians 6. I quoted part of this a moment ago. Look at verse 11. Put on, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. That word principalities is the word uh, first cause. <laughs> they say the, the first cause of sin was Satan himself. He's the one being referred to as the principality. And against powers and against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, 
Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. What have you, what have you proven <laughs> to be a safe and sure place to stand? Are the king's armor sufficient for you? Or has the glitter of those things tarnished in your eyes and the Lord has shown you there's only one place to stand. There's only one rock that's safe. Everything else is shifting sand. Everything else is unreliable and unstable. I've not proved the, I have proved those things, but I proved them to be unreliable. David said, I must go with that which I have proven, proven to be successful. <laughs> and it's the armor of God. There are six of them here mentioned. Let's take them quickly one at a time. Verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with the truth. Now what is the, what is the opposite of the truth? The lie. The lie is the opposite of the truth. What is the lie? The lie is free will. God, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says that God has sent them because they have no love for the truth, they have no love for Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ himself is the truth, and because they, you see, this is the armor that we must put on. <laughs> but what do we do? We try to fight our battles in the strength of our will. And where the Lord brings you when he brings you to where young David was and you are able to say, I haven't proven these things, you come to that place where you say, oh Lord, I tried that armor. Not my will. Lord, every time I exercise my will against these spiritual wickedness and enemies of sin and Satan, I find myself fall flat on my face. I've not proven them. This I have proved. The Lord Jesus Christ is the truth. The law came by Moses, or was, uh, but, uh, was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> I am the way, the truth, and the life. When the Lord is pleased by his grace, to prove himself faithful. We come to that place where, Lord, the law, can't, the law can't help me and my will can't help me. Because they had no love for the truth, therefore he sent them a strong delusion that they should believe the lie. You see, that's what... The world believes the lie. What is the lie? The lie is man's will. The lie is that I can do this. I can conquer this. I can fix this. I can solve this problem. And men put on the polished armor of their own will and they sharpen the sword of their own will and they go against the enemy only to be defeated. And the Lord tells us here, the first instrument of warfare is to gird your loins about with truth. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Peter puts it this way, he says, gird up the loins of your mind. <laughs> now, it, it, in order, the, the picture here is that men would have wore a, a, something of a flowing garment, a, a, a robe. And to 
and to gird up. When, when Peter was in prison in Acts chapter 13, the angel came to him and said, gird up your loins and follow me. In other words, Peter would have been sitting there in his robe and uh, the Lord said to him, gird up, gird up your loins. In other words, take that robe and fold it up between your legs and tuck it into your belt because we're going on a we're we're going to a battle here we're going to you see you 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 can't work in in a in a robe you have to make you have to make pants out of them and that's exactly what the girdy that's the picture here the soldier in order to go to battle can't fight in a robe he has to gird up that robe and tuck it into the belt of truth. The Lord Jesus Christ himself is seen in Revelation chapter 1 verse 13 as having a golden girdle gird about his paps. A golden girdle. Gold in the Bible is represented, represents perfection. What our Lord's saying is, don't try to fight this battle with the king's armor. As impressive as that armor might be and as convinced as everybody else is that it's going to be sufficient. Have you proved your will to be insufficient in this battle? Have you taken off the old man and put on the new man? That's what David did. David said, I, I, I've got to take these things off. They're not working for me. I haven't proved them. But one thing I have proved is that the Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient. He is sufficient. His grace is sufficient. You see, if you haven't proved his grace to be sufficient, then you're still trying to work things, aren't you? <laughs> what have you proved? What have you proved? Most men are still fighting this war in the king's armor. The Lord Jesus Christ says of himself in John chapter 1, the word was made flesh and he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and of truth. Truth. See, the whole, the whole world has bought the lie. The whole world is singing lies, lies. Tell me sweet little lies. That's all I want to hear. I want to hear lies. God causes you to put off that because it's not proven to be sufficient for you. You just want to know the truth. You just want to know Christ. And all that, all that is in him, <laughs> all that he is and all that he has done, all of his grace and all of his glory, he himself is the truth. So gird up the loins with the belt of truth. Go back with me to verse 14. Having on the breastplate of righteousness. Now breastplate is protecting the heart. <laughs> if the belt is designed to hold up uh, the, the loins of truth, the breastplate is designed to protect the vital organs. Most men go about trying to establish their own righteousness, which is of the law. They go about trying to present to God some work that will obligate God to save them. They present their will to God or they present their works to God. And we know that being ignorant of God's righteousness because God's righteousness is all in Christ. The end of the law is righteousness. 
Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So having the breastplate, you see, here again, all these things are going to take us back to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the truth. And he is our righteousness. And all our righteousness are as filthy rags. <laughs> um, we read it this morning in the men's study uh, before we came out um, that um, man at his very best state is altogether vanity. Altogether vanity. He's altogether empty. We have no righteousness before God. We try to present to God something that we've done in order to earn our favor with him. <clears throat> the Lord tells us in John chapter 12 to judge righteous judgments. David made some judgments. He put David, Saul put this armor on him. He's feeling the weight of it. He's trying to move about in it and he takes it off. He says, I haven't proved it. I need that which I've proven. And the Lord tells us in John chapter 12, judge righteous judgments. In other words, make some judgments like David did about what righteousness is. Where does your righteousness lie? What hope do you have that you would have acceptance before God? What reason do you have to come into his holy presence? Is it based on something you've done or some prayer that you prayed or some faith that you've exercised or some will that you've performed or some or is it all bound up in the glorious person of the Lord Jesus Christ does all of your righteousness before God what have you proven we're tempted as I said before, in each one of these, we're tempted to do what David did and put on the king's armor. But as soon as we put it on, we find it to be insufficient. We find ourselves, by God's grace, taking off the old man and putting on the new. Listen to what the scripture tells us in Acts chapter 17, verse 31. God, he, hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. The Lord Jesus Christ is the standard of righteousness which God accepts. This is my beloved son. In him I'm well pleased. I'm not pleased in anything you've done. I'm pleased in him. How are we going to come into the presence of God outside of the Lord Jesus Christ? And yet what joy and what hope and what comfort in the, in the slaying of the lion, Satan himself, and the slaying of the bear, the rigors of the law, and the judgment of God. There is when God gives us five smooth stones. By the way, the number five in the Bible, and we're not going to spend the time to look at all the references, but the number five is a number for grace in the Bible. Each, one of the, each, each number has a significant meaning. And so David picking up five stones, you know, I've heard people say, well, you know, he was, he was afraid in case he missed, or he's afraid, you know, maybe Goliath would happen. No, the deal was one David knew that, he, that Goliath was going to fall. The number five there is given to us in order to say that the truth of God in Christ and the righteousness of God in Christ is all of grace. It's all of grace. We can't merit it. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. We don't deserve it. God must give it freely by his grace. <clears throat> men uh, will wear the filthy rags of their own righteousness and think that they're, that they're wearing the dazzling armor of the king. 
You remember the story of the king who put on a wedding feast for his son? And there was a servant at the door giving a, a robe, a wedding robe to everyone, all the guests that came in. They had to wear this robe over their clothes. And the door was finally shut. And the king's walking around greeting his guest. And he sees a man in the, in the, in the place there where they didn't have a robe on. And I can just imagine, this man said to the servant at the door, why would I cover up these beautiful garments that I have with a plain white robe? I look, I look, I look great. And he would have, the king called the servant and said, take him, throw him out into utter darkness where there's weeping and wailing and the gnashing of teeth. You see what the picture of that is. The only one's, allowed into the king's presence are the ones who are going to have the robe of righteousness. And that robe can't be rent. You remember when our Lord was crucified and they took his robe and they were going to tear it and give it to the soldiers. And one of the soldiers says, this robe is seamless. Let us not rent it, but let us cast lots for it. <laughs> What a glorious picture of salvation. The casting of the lot into the lap is of the Lord. In other words, God was going to determine who got that robe and who didn't get it. And the soldiers could not tear it. What do men want to do? They want to rend the righteousness of Christ and sew in to his righteousness some of their own garment. Oh, something they've done, a prayer they prayed, some work they performed. They're so proud of what they've done. And the Lord said, don't rend the garment. Cast lots for it. And the answer of the lot in the lap is of the Lord. <laughs> the Lord's going to give that robe. <clears throat> Ah, don't you love the story of blind Bartimaeus? Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. Bartimaeus was a blind beggar, and we've seen beggars. Can't imagine what they would have looked like on the street of Jericho 2,000 years ago. The holy, filthy outer garment that that Bartimaeus would have been wearing. And he kept crying, have mercy upon me, have mercy upon me. And it's not of anything insignificant that the scriptures record that when they said to Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus, be of good cheer, the master calleth thee, that he took that robe off and dropped it right there in the gutter and went to Christ without his dirty, holy robe of righteousness. Bartimaeus, what would you have me to do for you? Oh, Lord, that I might see, that I might see. Here's the armor. We're not going to fight against these spiritual battles with the arm of flesh. We're not going to defeat the enemy in our good works or our free will. We must have the Lord Jesus Christ as all of our truth and all of our righteousness. Saul of Tarsus tried to fight the battle with those things, didn't he? <laughs> and then when the Lord revealed himself to Saul, he said, oh, those things that I thought were gained to me, I now see were the very things keeping me from Christ. What will, you see, here's the, here's the bottom line truth about righteousness. It's not sin that keeps men from Christ. It really isn't. It's righteousness. That's what will keep you from Christ. Your self-righteousness. You say, well, doesn't, you know, people are engaged in sin that they, you know, that, that they don't want to give up. Yeah. But it's their righteousness that has convinced them that one day, one day before they go to hell, before they die, they will give it up. That's their righteousness. 
You see, it's not the sin that they're unwilling to let go of that's keeping them from Christ. It's their righteousness because if they ever came to the conclusion that they have no power to put away that sin <laughs> and that only in Christ can they have a righteousness that's pleasing to God, then they'll come. It's not men's sin that keeps them from Christ. It's their righteousness. What have you proved? What have you proved? The arm of flesh, the king's armor, <laughs> the sharpened sword of, well, let's, let's look. Look at the fourth one, the third one, verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me tell you what most folks want. Most folks, folks want the peace of God. But you can't have the peace of God until you have peace with God. Now they come together. They come together, but you can't have one without, without the other. And the only way to have peace with God is to have the Lord Jesus Christ offer himself as your ransom and your righteousness and your justification before God, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And only then does the peace of God that passeth understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Our feet must be shod with the preparation of the gospel. I can see Paul in his, in his Roman jail writing these, uh, thinking about, now he's not, he's not right when he, when he's, he's seeing a Roman soldier. <laughs> he's saying, well, that, what that Roman soldier is wearing is uh, their spiritual truths to each one of those things. And he sees that Roman soldier with these shoes on. He said, oh, we ought to have our, if we're going to walk in a way that's going to be pleasing with God, our feet must be shod with the preparation of the gospel. You can't have the gospel without Christ. <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ himself is the gospel. He's the good news. He's the truth of God. He's our righteousness. Our feet are feet of clay. Even those seraphim in Isaiah chapter 6 where we, where we see the seraphim hovering over the throne of God and uh, crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Even they had to take two of their six wings and cover their feet. Why? Because our feet, we're, we, we're, our feet represent our, our worldly. That's our, it's our connection to this earth, isn't it? It's our worldliness. When we come in, when the Lord Jesus washed the feet of the disciples and Peter said, wash me all over. The Lord said, no, you're already clean all over. You need your feet washed. Your feet are dirty. Why? Because you've been walking out there in the world. And when we see the Lord Jesus Christ revealed in the, in the book of Revelation, we see that he had feet brazen as brass. No feet of clay there. His feet are glorious. Oh, we must have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. We can't walk outside of Christ. We can't walk in this world. We can't have, we, we've got to have our feet covered. The preparation of the gospel of peace. <laughs> of peace fourthly verse 16 above all above all it's the most important take the shield of faith now faith is not our contribution to salvation to make faith a decision or a choice is to deny the very meaning of faith. Faith is what happens when you've got no place else to go. 
Faith is what happens when God strips you of all of your choices and all of your decisions. You've tried the king's armor. The Lord has shown you that they can't be proved. You've got to have the five smooth stones of grace in order to, in order to defeat that, that enemy. You've got to have that which God has proved. <laughs> no. Faith is what happens when you've got no place else to go. Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. We know and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You have shut us up to yourself. If you're not giving a choice on something, you can't. If there's only one option, you can't say, well, I chose that. The very idea of choice means that you've got two or more options. And if you chose Christ because you had something else to choose from, you didn't choose Christ. You got a figment of your imagination, of false Christ, isn't it? Turn me, Lord, and I'll be turned. Cause me to come unto thee. Cause thy face to shine upon me, and I will be saved. Lord, don't leave me to myself. Don't, don't give me any choices. Don't give me any options. Shut me up to Christ. I've tried the king's armor. It doesn't work. I've got to have that which is proved. I've got to have the truth. I've got to have the breastplate of righteousness. I've got to have my feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I've got to have peace with God. I've got to have this shield of faith. You see, faith is, is what happens when you are brought by God's grace to see that you have no ability to do anything to save yourself. I love it when that leper came to the Lord and he said, Lord, thou can if thou will. Now the false gospel says this, God's willing to save you. He wants to save everybody. Christ died for everybody, but his hands are tied. He can't do it unless you make a decision, unless you allow him, unless you do something. And they make a work out of faith. Faith is their contribution. Faith is what moves the hand of God to save them. The most important thing is the shield of faith. There's no coming to Christ without faith. And faith is the gift of God. It's the gift of God. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that faith is not of yourself. It's a gift of God. And the sinner cries like Bartimaeus. Drops his robe of self-righteousness. And comes to the Lord Jesus. The Lord, I believe... Help thou mine unbelief. You made me to believe. Verse 17, number 5. And take the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. <laughs> what does the helmet do? Protects your head doesn't it oh our our minds are remember when when uh, Naaman the Syrian who was afflicted with leprosy came down to Elisha and Elisha sent his servant out told Naaman to go wash in the river Jordan and Naaman the scripture says was wroth he was angry and what did he say? He said, I thought the man would come out to me. 
Well, there's your problem, David. You thought. And that's your problem and my problem, isn't it? When our thought, you see, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. As the heavens are high above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. <laughs> but we rely upon our thoughts, don't we? Well, this seems prudent. This seems reasonable. This seems right. It seems like I ought to be able to defeat this with this thought and with this idea. And I thought, Lord, let my thoughts be your thoughts. Lord, every time I try to do something in the power of my own will, every time I try to wear the king's armor, it just weighs me down and, and, I, and I haven't proved it to work. It's not proved. Matter of fact, I proved it to be inadequate. Lord, let my thoughts be your thoughts. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are Good and holy and pure and lovely and righteous. Think on these things. <laughs> Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's the only. All these things point back to Christ, don't they? All these things strip us of the things that the world has, is trying to prove that we've proven don't work. Lord, my head is unprotected. My thoughts are so wild and so wandering and so wrong. Lord, enable me. Enable me to think on these things. Enable me to look in faith to Christ and to believe. You see, we looked at this recently in the book of Hebrews. It speaks of the mind and the heart. Uh, yes, the mind is the intellect and the heart is the affections, but, but they're not separated. What you... What you are affectionate toward in your heart, you think in your mind. And so, and so here's, the, here's the thing. We, we have to have our thoughts right about who God is, about who we are, that God is sovereign, that he's holy, that he's just. We... we that we're sinners and that we have to have right thoughts about how it is that God's pleased to save sinners through the sacrifice of his son. The helmet of salvation <laughs> and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Oh, so many opinions out there, isn't there? So many words, so much advice. Worldly advice might be sufficient for worldly things. If you have a financial need, I, I, I advise you to get some advice from somebody that knows about those sort of things. If you have a medical need, I advise you to go to someone who can help you in that area. Worldly advice is good for worldly things, but we're not talking about worldly things here. We're talking about a giant that the world is trying to defeat in the king's armor. And the question is, what have you proved? What have you proved in defeating this enemy. Oh, I pray and hope that the Lord will enable us to prove that Christ is everything in salvation. The only time I have peace is when God enables me to look to Christ, that I've proved God to be faithful. I've proved him to be full of mercy when I've cried out to him, he's answered me. 
He's met my needs. I've proved his grace to be sufficient in salvation. I proved his word to be effectual and living and powerful and true. Yes, David against Goliath stands as a representative pointing us to the Lord Jesus who got the victory for all of Israel. But David also is a picture of you and me with this question. What have we proved? Our Heavenly Father, how often we are drawn to the king's armor. Give us the grace to take off the old man and to put on the new man. For we know that he alone has been proved. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 268. 268? 268. Let's stand together.